And I was going to say good morning. Well, I guess for Peter it is, but for everybody else, good afternoon on this Friday. Welcome to the Food Safety Chat. And my name is Brian Armentrout. And if you're here, welcome. Pull up a chair and prepare for some amazing content around food safety. If you're new to the chat, welcome. Every Friday, normally at 8 a.m. Mountain Time, 10 a.m. Eastern, we do the food safety chat. But because of the time differential, we've, we've uh, kind of pushed it back today. So we appreciate you being here. But one of the things that you'll notice here with this chat is that this is not a presentation. This is a conversation. And what we do here is we bring an expert on the show to talk about a particular subject around food safety and get your feedback and comments and, most importantly, questions. And so I'm really happy here today to bring on my good friend, Peter Holtman. How are you doing today, Peter? I'm great, Brian. And Peter is in gorgeous Sydney, Australia. If you've never been there, it's one of the most amazing cities in the world. It's a good place to be. We spent no, we spared no expense to bring this to you today, Brian. We're uh, on the beautiful east coast of Sydney, and I've got a lovely shot of the, the beach outside my window today. Oh, super jealous. And so I am in Loveland, Colorado, and that's one of the traditions we love doing here on the chat is let us know in the comments where in the world that you are at. So just punch it in there. And so as we're going through the topic here today, if you have questions, one of the things that we love to do during this, and this is here for you, this is meant to be interactive, is type your questions in and we'll work them into the conversation. So as they pop up, Peter and I can both see the comments here because we're live streaming on LinkedIn, YouTube, and Twitter all at the same time. So if you have any comments, please throw them in there. So with that, and, and so Peter, it's, it's uh, <laughs> I was kind of playing around. One of the things I love to do here is like, it's like, what's the best way to describe the guest? And with you, it's kind of hard, right? It's, it's because you're doing so many things, right? Yeah. You are the leader, owner, and managing director of Holtman Professional Services. So what, what kind of, uh, give us a little taste of what you do. Yeah, I think uh, in the industry, we call it professional know-it-all. So uh, uh, <laughs> nothing worse, Brian, nothing worse. Um, so I, these days I spend a, most of my time uh, doing risk assessments for uh, such a broad range of, of uh, industries and governments and basically across the globe, uh, wherever there's a need to sit down and, and look at future risk and, uh, and potential to to meet and manage future risk, you'll probably find me in a room talking to someone about it. Yeah, absolutely. And so Peter and I, guys, we've known each other for years now, and we met at a conference. And that's why conferences are always such you know great places to network and interact and, and meet new friends and new colleagues with the same interests and the same uh, outlook, I guess is the best way to put it relative to these type of things. Now, one of the things I read on your LinkedIn profile that caught my eye as well, is you're a justice of the peace? I, I am a justice of the peace, exactly. So, in fact, uh, just yesterday I was uh, justice of the peacing uh, for a few people in my local community. Yeah, <laughs> that's awesome. I love it. Did Did you send anybody to jail or anything like that? <laughs> no, we, we we don't carry guns and badges, and we don't walk with spurs on our on our boots down <laughs> here. But uh, we do far more menial uh, tasks for the for the courts down here. The things that they don't want to waste uh, judges' times with, so they send it out to people like us that go through a very rigid process of um, of uh, qualifying to be a justice of the peace. And then it, basically it's a, it's, a, it's a very fancy admin clerk for the courts. <laughs> Although I think if I was going up in court and, and you were the justice, you're an intimidating figure, right? So I'm sure the people are, you know. They're is it because I'm so handsome, Brian? Is that what it is? So. <laughs> 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 so uh, one of the things, and, and it, it's funny, so Alexis, welcome, and Mohammed, welcome to you as well. Uh, one of the things that we do on the chat here, and sometimes, uh, Peter, I always skip over this, is we share a ceremonial lifting of the cup, everybody. So join us, grab your favorite beverage, and join us. Cheers. Cheers. Ah, very good. A little early for me now, so it's still water for me. Coffee for you, I assume, at this hour for you. Uh, I, got, I just had a coffee. I'm onto a tea right now. Onto a tea. Nice. So, oh, gosh. I mean, so with this chat, so if, if you're familiar with the chat, one of the things that we do here is we do kind of a pre-conversation. And so Peter and I were talking earlier this week and kind of going over the topic. And I think our pre 
chat was longer than this chat's going to be because there was so much material yeah. and so much to talk about here. So trying to keep this on time is going to be a little bit difficult, but I, I think we can do it. So we'll, we'll dive in here right away. So we'll start off with kind of a general question is, as you kind of referenced a little bit ago as well, Peter, is that in your role and in your business, you're traveling all over the place and visiting all these markets. And what are you what are you seeing out there in the real world? Yeah, it's an interesting question, Brian. And uh, I guess how we started this chat was around what, are, what am I seeing in the food food manufacture, food safety yeah. world? And uh, the, I guess it's, it's something that's been bubbling away in the back of my head for a long time. And it's really played out in the last 12 months, the last two years with COVID, with Suez Canal issues and all that is just how important inside a business is the whole food safety compliance process versus food supply, which is just get it onto market, make your money and keep the doors open, keep the lights on, keep people employed. And unfortunately, it's food supplies winning out. Uh, okay. Now, this might make a, a bunch of people on this on this call, on this uh, podcast irate, saying, how dare you say something like that? Food safety is tantamount. It's so important. And you know what? I agree, but it's not winning the argument at the mm. end of the day. Um, and there's a, a, quite a host of reasons why it's not. Well, and, and I think that's a good point, Peter, because one of the things that, you know, anybody who's involved with standards and compliance and food safety and these type of things, there's there's this little kind of nagging voice in our heads, which is always there, which is, okay, if what we're doing is working, why aren't recalls and illnesses going down right? yeah. every year? It's the same numbers and it doesn't go down. I think that's to your point. Compliance, right? Having the audits, getting FDA or whatever particular agency into your facility, these type of things is not translating into that. And getting the product into the market appears to be the main goal. Right. That's exactly what's happening. And look, I've been a food safety auditor since 2000, I think it was. So a good 20 odd years worth of being an auditor in the field, being a consultant, being a trainer in food safety, a technical college, university, private institutions. And what I'm finding always quells the argument around good food safety practice is food safety compliance. And that's a game you can't win. Compliance is not set up to demonstrate your best practices, but to highlight your weaknesses. So yeah. How can you build a sustainable system out of compliance when the whole point of it is to show up your flaws and weaknesses? And, and what are you learning as a person, as a business, as a team around how to work within the compliance framework? That's that's the scary part of it. You know? And I'm, I'm a product of that environment. Like I said, I've been an auditor. I've sat in the United Nations in Geneva writing standards. I've been to that level, I've worked in the United Nations in, in other regulatory and framework functions, and I've, I've sat on factory floors watching, you know, watching product go past me, you know, for, for hours on end to see if it was if it was safe. And the game is geared to fail the company. And yep. I, we see that stuff in the audit reports. I was thinking about this at like 3 a.m. my time this morning because I was uh, really working up for this, is... Um, you look at an audit report, how many sections and how many flavors of wrong are being reported to you? There's at least three types of non-conformity. There's critical, major, minor, and then mm. there's opportunity for improvement. There's four different ways of Sunday for a report to tell you you're doing a bad job. Mm. Where is the section that talks about where you're doing a good job and where your strengths are? It's just not mm. in those reports. Wow. I mean, yeah. And, and so when we talked about that earlier this week, that hit me and it's like, Holy shit. That's, I mean, yeah. yeah. And we've all been through it because you, you have the audit, the auditor comes into your facility, you're the quality manager, you babysit the audit, it closes out, the plant manager shows up to the closing. And what's the first thing the plant manager says? What's my score? Yeah. And if it's yeah, not yeah. a very good score, then he starts fighting with the auditor on trying to improve the score. Yeah. It's a game where the plant's whole purpose is to, win the audit, mm -hmm. which is show them what they need to see, put records in front of them what they need to read, answer questions the way they want to hear the questions answered, and hopefully that minimises the number of faults and mistakes that they write into our 
final report. And when you've got a minimum number of faults and mistakes, you get certified. Yeah. You're not certified on your strengths. You're, you're certified on the lack of lack of weaknesses. Right. And what happens then on the, on the uh, standard side, the writing of the different standards and things of that nature, if things aren't going the way that the standards want them to go or regulatory groups, they just write more rules, right? That, yeah. that, that it just piles on rules, on rules, on rules. This and is, go ahead. I'm sorry. I was going to say, yeah, it's like, it's like I've just handed you a gravy flavored lollipop, right? And you're going, I, I hate this thing. And the standard comes out and says, no, you, you're licking it the wrong way. Instead of holding it horizontally, you've got to hold it vertically. It's going to taste much better. That's garbage. Yeah. You know? Oh, yeah. That's and then, yeah, you should be licking it more. Yeah. That, yeah. That it'll taste, yeah, it'll yeah. taste better. Yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah. Sure it will. Yeah. And <laughs> I mean, so definitely, and thank you, Corey. I'm glad you're here as well. Profound point. Absolutely. Right. And as we were talking about this as well, this is one of the design flaws within this overall system. We have auditors who their only role is to find fault. And then you have consultants who help you build systems. And the two groups are completely incompatible and they yep. never talk. As a matter of fact, it's verboten. If I'm an auditor and I'm in your plant and I see something and I'm like, well, you know, your, your management commitment is, is okay, but here's a good practice that I've seen. Yep. You're, you're no longer an auditor. Yeah, yeah, that's all right. There are people already telling you you're crossing a line. And this session is not an auditor bashing session. It's not even about that. It's the way auditors are trained, like the referees going onto a football pitch, onto a football field, is you're meant to look at rules in a certain way. You're meant to ask one-sided directional questions to get the responses to the questions that are on the checklist in front of you. There's no deviation from that or very little. And then you quickly get off site because time is money and they're trying to minimize your cost of being on site versus what they've charged the client. So the only way to do that is quickly write up all the negatives, leave it with the client and get off. And then you see auditors writing up things like grammatical errors and spelling mistakes and uh, misreference standards and things like that. That adds no value to anybody, but that's what they're, that's what we're working with these days, you know? Right. So in a lot of ways, and this is something I talk about on the chat, Peter, as well, is there's this view within the academic side of food safety and quality assurance management systems and things like this, that just the act of writing something down of we, we're going to do this means that it's actually going to happen. And that couldn't be farther from the truth. And yeah. that approach comes from the auditing side as well. It carries through the entire system. And it's, it's not set up for growth. And it's, as everybody always talks about, it's a snapshot. It's just yeah. that one particular window in time and show me a plant that doesn't prepare for an audit. Right? Yeah. Say, okay. Let's, let's, let's clean and we'll do a little bit of painting and we'll get caught up on our training, everybody. Okay. Eh, put on a good face, yeah. you know, for, for the auditor when they show up and, uh, and then back to business after the auditor leaves, it doesn't work. Right. And, and, and I think, um, COVID really helped, to your point, Peter, stress the system. Um, so Daniela had a question here. From your perspective, how can this be corrected? Oh, I love that question because that's exactly what we're going to talk about. And this is what we've been working over. And this is, this is why that we're so yeah. excited for this chat here today because this is such an important topic. Because yeah. really, I mean, what we're talking about here is we had all these systems and everything that we built and all of our programs and all these audits and everything is going along. And then all of a sudden COVID hits, right? Yeah. And you want to talk about the mother of all stressors. That was the ultimate stress test for the entire food supply chain. Yeah, absolutely. And so during COVID, I was still one of the poor bunnies on a plane in a, in a rubber suit and a mask, you know, flying around to all, all over the world, literally ever in one in 10 days, I was in, Africa, I was in Europe, I was in Asia, I was in America, and then I was back home in Australia within a 10 day period, looking at clients and doing risk assessments. And Daniel, I promise you we're going to answer your question. This is not all about what's wrong with our system. It's also about what we can do with what we've got in the system as well. And what COVID showed me is just how frail, literally how frail compliance systems are. The minute you take the referee off the field, it's it's what it's whatever you can do to score a goal, 
That's what happens. And so what I saw, this is exactly what I saw, and I'm not making this up, is people stockpiled. They stockpiled as many ingredients and, and, and components to their manufacturers as they possibly can. And they weren't the only ones doing it. The entire world was doing it. So what happens when your favourite A-rated supplier runs out of, out of supply? Then you go to your B supplier. Then you go to your C supplier. I was seeing people going to people where they said they swear they would never buy from these people, but they're the only option left. Yeah. And, and now they're buying in problem into their process. The, the food safety is at risk. The, the ability to manufacture safe product is at risk. But you know what? Food supply won because people were thinking, if I don't get this, I don't manufacture, I don't put product in the market and I lose out to the competitor. And so food safety lost. It, it, it was plain and simple. And, you know, people can sit there and say, this doesn't happen. This is not true. It was rare cases. I have been in so many factories and plants and processing places where this was occurring. It's not a one-off thing. It's really yeah. not. And so, yeah, the, the entire system was stressed by COVID. The referees were all taken off the field. FDA wasn't going to plants. Auditors weren't visiting plants. All yep. these type of activities, it's like, okay, cool. And then war, right? So, of course, the big war with Ukraine. And so for some of my clients, right, critical ingredients come from Ukraine. Did I know that before it happened? No. Right yeah. now, all of a sudden, they're scrambling. And it's like, okay, our formula for this product, we can no longer make. R&D is trying to come up with alternate formulas. They're trying to push it onto the market to keep in business. And they're just hoping to God that the yep. system doesn't break. This is very true. I had people asking me if I knew a way of getting train loads of wheat out of Ukraine to it across the border somewhere so they could export it from a port. They were saying, do you know any way of doing that? Do you know a safe channel? Because I, I work a lot in product recall, a lot in, in, in crisis management. So when big things are going down or around the world, I'm usually somewhere behind the scenes orchestrating a solution to it. And so I, this is what was happening, Brian. You're absolutely right. People are scrambling for any way of of supplying the market rather than sort of scaling back or changing product or, or, or stopping, you know, heaven forbid you actually push the big red button, you know, and stop production. People were finding any avenue to put the same product on the market. Right. And then, of course, if you're a criminal, you're looking at this stress and saying, this is the perfect opportunity to me for me to produce fraudulent products and sell them. Yeah. Yeah, either produce it, intercept it on route through the logistics chain and, and repurpose, repackage, whatever it might be to, to make a near identical product and put it out there. So many opportunities. Yeah, well, what was that example you were talking about with the pet food? What, that, that blew my mind. Yeah, so this is a very, very high-end pet food uh, su supplier and, and, uh, and distributor around the world. And they were sending their product into China and it was intercepted before it reached their warehouses in China and diverted to another warehouse where it was then remixed with other, with other product of, of much lesser quality and unknown ingredient and packed in almost near identical packaging with one small difference. The pack size was an odd size. It was an in-between size between the, the commonly used brands. And then that was pushed back onto the market through this channel and sold in, in regular corner stores and pet food stores and that unbeknownst to the people that were buying it, selling it on and making animals sick. And the only reason the company found out about it was because there was there was like a flurry of, of complaints and social media backlash about this very expensive high-end product now causing illness to animals. And they're going, what are you talking about? Send us back a bag of the product. And it wasn't even their pack size. So that mm -hmm. alerted them saying something's gone very wrong in this mm -hmm. process. We've got fraud in the system. And so we had to work that one through to the end to figure out what actually happened there and how do we... How do we restore faith in the brand to the consumers? Because they don't know any different. It yeah. looks the same. Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah. So, I mean, it was just luck, right? They, they, they missed that one simple little variable, the pack size. Otherwise, yeah. it would have gone a lot longer. Yeah, it was only like maybe one or two pounds difference in size of the bag. So it wasn't majorly different, but it was enough to, to get picked up under closer inspection.
Yeah. So yeah, ingredient substitution. The other thing that we saw is this model that the world has been developing around just-in-time manufacturing. It's like, oh, okay, mm. this is great. We'll keep our costs low. We'll get an order. We'll make exactly that product. We'll send it out and it'll be in the grocery store the next day. Life is good. Well, COVID changed that really quickly. COVID did and Suez Canal incident as well. Suddenly you've got products sitting in a container jammed on a sandbank somewhere, you know, in, in, in the Straits of Africa and you're wondering, you know, what are you going to do next type stuff? So you buy anything from anywhere to, to make up the difference and, and jack the price up as well because the now the shipping routes are charging 300, 400, 500% in some cases increase in shipping containers around the world. So why not yeah. jump on that bandwagon? Yeah. Well, and, and then here in the US, where, where the pictures of the ports on the West Coast in San Diego and Los Angeles and things like this with container yards filled to the brim and they couldn't get to them. And so even if you're able to order your product and get it in, it was sitting in the port and couldn't get yeah. anywhere. Absolutely. It could be like, I know examples of like containers, multiple, multiple containers of frozen pork that could be sitting in frozen storage for up to 12 months hmm. before, it, before it made it to the plant to do something with it. Yeah. And, and I mean, even on a personal level, we all saw this from COVID as well. Toilet paper. Right? There yeah. was never a shortage of toilet paper. It was nope. all the market overreacting. Yeah, we had people leaving the, the capital cities, driving into rural areas here to bulk buy and bring it back to their homes. It just, But Brian, I'm, I'm sure we've all got, uh, everyone listening here has got some war story around food safety and, and, and poor actions, poor activity, or an auditor missing something that another auditor's picked up, et cetera, et cetera. It really just highlights this whole point about how incomplete compliance processes are really are and how unsustainable they are without this um, enforcing network, almost like a policing uh, network setting, which is unfortunately the auditor, which is designed to go in and find fault, not mm -hmm. to show companies best practice. Right. Exactly. It's all about checking that box. And it, it comes back to that saying that we've all heard is when you're setting up metrics in a company, your key performance indicators, all these type of things, you have to be really, really careful what you set up. Uh, the example I use on this is, and this goes in really well with our talk here today, is procurement. If you tell the procurement group, okay, guys, your job is to find raw materials as cheaply as possible. It's how we're going to grade you. It's how you're going to get your bonus. And it's how we're going to decide if you keep working here. Well, guess what they're going to do, right? They yeah. don't, they're not, they're not going to care about food safety, anything else. It's going to be find me the cheapest garbage I can find because that's what my boss told me to do. And so you have to be really careful with metrics. And it's it's funny how food ceases to be food on a production line when targets have overtaken, which is we need to produce so many metric tons regardless today. And you've got a, a low paid operator on that line that maybe doesn't have the same appreciation for food safety as it as something's whizzing past him on the line, you know, with, with something wrong with it. And it's because it's not food anymore. They don't see it as food they just see it as stuff yeah. and and that, that talks to behaviors around how do we how can we reinforce food safety behaviors if we're not showing them best way of doing it right and and so yeah back to the covid side of it as well so during covid skeleton crews in in plants they're just they're just trying to find people to work right so somebody shows up it's like okay hey are, okay are, are you on drugs all right no okay great you're over here on this line. I need you to watch this line. And no understanding at all, right? They're just taking the cue from their supervisor, whoever's watching over them. And that person's directive has been, to your point, Peter, get the product out the door, right? Yeah. We're way behind on orders. We've got to get product in the supermarkets. And the inherent message, said or unsaid, is I don't care how you do it. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Just get it done. You know, and here's the crazy thing that, that maybe this is the world's best kept secret. Lean in with me, Brian. Let me tell you a little secret here. Just between us, systems don't run companies. People run companies. Mm. Say that again, please. Yes. Systems don't run companies. People run companies. <laughs> it's funny how anytime something breaks down, goes wrong, causes an issue in a business, some person is usually root cause of these things. It's a behavior. It's an act that someone's 
uh, performed that's created this issue. You know, it's you can have all the CCPs in the world, you can have all the systems written and then rewritten and audited. If something goes wrong, it's usually as a result of something that someone's made a decision on or tried to problem solve and it's not worked. Yeah, perfect example of that from my past is I worked for a company and we had uh, cheese processing equipment and we moved it from one plant to another plant on the other side of the country. And they didn't bring the workers along with the equipment. They just put the new equipment in the new plant, set it up, had new people running that equipment. Nightmare, absolute nightmare. Mm -hmm. We had all kinds of quality failures, all kinds of bad seals on the product. And it just kept getting worse and worse. And for me, that was it was the poster child example. And management was scrambling to put together orders and they couldn't figure out why. And that's where I learned that lesson was you didn't train the people. You just assumed that the machines made the product and the people didn't have much of a say in it. And they absolutely do. Because, I mean, if you, if you have a machine and it's doing like heat sealing or things of this nature, setting that up is critical. What's the right temperature? What's the right dwell time? Do we have the yeah. right packaging in place? Is it aligned correctly? All these little details that are on that line that that operator needs to completely understand and the supervisor needs to evaluate and train that person on that activities, that's quality. Yeah. Brian, let's pick on a typical example. Let's just talk about temperature control and you, you get to your, your large uh, chill rooms or freezer rooms and, and I only work in Celsius. So uh, imagine you're going up to, a, to a, 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 fr a chilled room and it's meant to be running at five Celsius, but you look at the dial and you look at the records and it's consistently moving between five and say seven Celsius. Mm -hmm. Now, who's making the call and who's making the call to say that's safe? You know, and who said... What do we do about investigating product if it hits six? Because five is meant to be the threshold, right? That's what we all talk about in, in, in food safety circles is there are temperature limits that you're meant to be working at. So what happens if we exceed it on a daily basis? There's no scientist in the workplace that's going to say, well, let's do a quick validation study and say, okay, we can actually run this product to six and it's going to be safe because we've done it. So someone with far less technical skill is making a decision that six is now okay and six becomes a regular practice next and then it creeps and you get to seven and i've been to places where they just stop recording they don't bother about it yeah yeah because i mean a lot of times too right it's it's run and record and if you let's say you missed a little bit of time somebody was on vacation and nobody squawked or complained yeah okay fine we'll just keep, yeah. uh, we'll keep running but hey, the system is there. There's all this paperwork that you fill out. There's a procedure that sits behind it that says how many times a day you're meant to look at the dial stuck on the outside of this thing. There's uh, there's an underpinning management plan that says the temperature is a critical factor and the auditors have come through and said, yeah, you've got that written in your system. But it still fails. It mm -hmm. still fails. And why does it fail? Again, it's those people in the system, not always intentionally. You know, there's these... Most product recalls are caused by accidental uh, contamination or impact to, to product, right? It's very rare these days you get malicious product tamper. Yes, it's, in, it's increasing. I've had to deal with them. We've had to investigate them and solve it. But by and large, it's through accidental or uh, un, unintentional or just uninformed. Like, let's to put a finer point on it, stupidity. So, mm -hmm. you know, people thought it was okay. Yeah, and, and here's an interesting uh, little thought experiment for our audience, if you have the opportunity to go out and try this, is go into a production facility, one of your plants or if you're an auditor or whatever, go into one of them and ask an operator on the line, okay, this thing that you're doing here, what, uh, what are your parameters? What are you measuring? It's like, oh, we're doing temperature. Okay, great. What's, what's the temperature? Oh, it, it should be around 30 degrees. Okay, great. Now go ask the, go ask the uh, supervisor the same question. It's like, What's the temperature? Ah, it's supposed to be around 32. Well, the operator just said 30. Oh, yeah, that's right. We put in some new cooling equipment here last week, and it's it, it, that, yeah, that's, they're right. That's a new temperature. Okay, great. The farther yeah. you go up the chain of command, the worse your information is going to be. Go ask the yeah. plant manager that same question, and he's going to say, oh, yeah, we're running at 40 degrees. Yeah. Because he's operating on information that's six months or a year old. Leadership, they just physically don't have the time to keep track of all those type of things. 
the true interaction, the true managing of this data and the processes, and as we're talking about today, the actual people managing the processes is between that operator and that supervisor. That's Absolutely. where the action takes place. Yeah. So, Daniel, we're starting to answer your question in part here. I think you're starting to get the gist of it, that this is what we're really concerned with is how people and, and culture and behaviours influence food safety, sustainability, and try and reverse the flow of food supply uh, culture that, that we're starting to see out there. Yep, absolutely. Some fantastic comments here. So Sebastian has a good one here as well. So resistance to change, right? P yeah, people don't like change. And they especially don't like change if they don't know why, right? If, yeah. if, you, go, if you just go around barking orders and say, do this now, and then you walk away, right? Ain't going to happen. Is yeah, it's the what's in it for me thing, right? Like it's 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 got to register and have some intrinsic value in your limbic system for you to say, I get it because it means something because, you know, hey, if, if someone's eating this product and it could be a child, it could be a grandmother, it could be a pregnant woman at the end of the day, we might be killing that person. You know, yeah. And how many operators have to sit there and think about that? Well, I, I don't think it happens that often unless you remind them that you're playing with food and it has those, those impacts and... Like I posted a comment on on an, another blog post recently about this, about, you know, people are absent-minded when it comes to this, and it sort of blew up. Some people got on there and say, I run these large catering kitchens and we pump out 900 to 1,000 meals a day. No one's died the last time I checked. Well, that's a nice attitude to have, that you obviously represent the entire planet here. Thanks for putting me back in my place, who goes to, you know, hundreds and hundreds of these places every year and sees something different. So. Exactly. It, the phrase that I always look out for, Peter, is this. If I'm if I'm doing an investigation and looking at these type of things, and if somebody says to me, well, we've never had a problem before. Oh, oh. Yeah. So, so what you're saying is the luck that you had in the past is going to somehow translate into the future forever. Wow, that's yeah. that's an amazing strategy. <laughs> Tell me more yeah. about that. Okay. Well, this is where that, that's why I now work in risk, because risk predicts uh future events and what and it's different to an audit because an audit is about you're making a mistake now risk is about what can potentially lead to a mistake in the future and it doesn't mean i'm always looking for the neg negative side i'm looking for strength-based practices that are going to minimize the opportunity for that for that uh mistake to happen and you know the crazy thing is i remember when they back in that was it uh 2016 or thereabouts, or maybe a little bit earlier, they're starting to write in risk-based thinking, risk-based auditing, risk-based approach into standards without any clear definition of what that meant. And again, risk is about um, understanding the probability of an event occurring or not occurring the way you expected it to go. That means there's positive and negative risks, which means you've got to look at strengths-based activity as well as um, uh, oversights or weaknesses in systems and well as well and see if one is countering the other it's a far more holistic look at it than a compliance-based audit you know absolutely and so part of this and I've, I've done this in my past as well is groups outside of food safety and quality assurance have a huge impact on what we have to deal with so for example something that rarely comes up peter is mergers and acquisitions so yeah. when, when a company is looking at buying a brand or a, a new product or things of this nature and they're out shopping around, it's all a financial decision. So they go in, they look at the books. Is this profitable? How much can we buy it for? Is the accounting all good and things like this? Very rarely, if never, do they talk to the food safety people and say, hey, tell you what, we're looking at buying this company. Go check out their factory and mm. see how they're doing. We want to understand, to your point, the risk of this particular brand. No, it, it, they buy it and then they come to me and they say, oh, hey, by the way, uh, we bought this thing and, and we found some stuff. I think uh, you, you've got some work to do, right? Yeah, yeah, it's crazy. Like uh, uh, culture is a big thing. How do you jam two cultures together or do you integrate? Is it assimilate? And if it's assimilation, what culture wins? Is it, is it uh, uh, the one that talks about food supply or is it about food safety? culture that wins and I've, I've seen good examples and I've seen atrocious examples of how this plays out for, for an organization. Right. And, and, and that's, and this is kind of, yeah, getting back to the earlier questions of, okay, this is great. How can we fix this? 
And really this gets around kind of the model that we follow relative to how we approach fixing these things, right? Because we're all hearing a lot about food, safety, culture, right? Yeah. And standards are written and documents are created and, you know, 1.7 point, 2 point, you know, subparagraph A, you shall do this and all these type of things. Okay, great. Does that really translate into it? Or are we just repeating the same pattern we've been following this, this all along? Oh, that's so true, Brian. Uh, culture cannot be assessed uh, using a checklist. It cannot be mashed into a compliance process. It just doesn't work. It's Culture is about changing behaviours and attitudes to how you work, which is, mm -hmm. am I doing the best I can do right now? Am I making the best decision on what's just whizzing past me right now to, to, make, to say it's safe, it's not safe? That stuff does not come out in a checklist and definitely not in a 15-minute, 20-minute overview whilst, whilst you're on site doing an assessment for something else, particularly if these days auditors are so crunched to do multiple standards assessments at mm -hmm. once uh, to, to save money and time because it's all about the death spiral of money in auditing these days, that how can you do any assessment, or let alone have meaningful questions, open questions around culture because you've got to allow people to explain their beliefs, which, yeah. which is what you were saying before, the why statement is a belief. It's not a system. It's why do I choose to work in this manner? Why do I choose to put this amount of attention, care and pride into my work as opposed to the person standing directly next to me who might have a different idea of why am I doing that safe? You cannot do that with an audit tool on food culture. Yeah. Yeah. And an audit tool is yes or no, right? It's a checklist. And yeah. culture is not a checklist. There is no, and there never will be a checklist that says, okay, hit these 200 questions and, and congratulations, you have a food safety culture. Yeah. It's and, nuts. And what's weird, and I'm, see, I'm sure you've seen this as well, Peter, is it doesn't, I've been in small plants with very limited resources that had fantastic culture. And yeah. I've been in large corporate owned facilities that had horrible culture, right? It's not the size of the company. No, it has nothing to do with the company. It has everything to do with the people that are at the, at the helm running it and, and have a vested interest in what comes out. Their, their warehousing doors packed up ready for ready for use somewhere else you know I've, I've rich, uh, recently just come back from Vietnam I was working over there uh, looking at food production food manufacturing most people think oh these these Asian countries they, they've got no standards they've got no scruples they got this couldn't be further from the truth you know I walked into this place and it was probably one of the best production facilities I've ever, ever been into in all my 30 odd years in this industry it was probably one of the best i've been into and it wasn't the cleanliness of the facility or the organization of it or the smooth flow of product moving through it seamlessly to minimize cross-contamination all of that was great stuff you could see there was thought put into it and care and attention what made the difference was how people were working mm. how they how they were handling product how they could track and trace product, how they would be willing to answer questions for you before you've even asked the question. And it wasn't an audit. They knew I wasn't there to audit, but they were so keen and willing to tell you about their practices and processes along the way that, that it, was, it, was, it was remarkable. It really was remarkable going through this place. And it, as you tell that story, you can't help but smile. That That's, that's what we're trying to get to yeah. is pride, pride in what we're doing. And, and it's interesting because it's kind of like that old saying, I, you know, I, I don't know what art is, but I know what I like. Yeah. It's, it's the same with food safety. Uh, and as auditors and consultants and people who visit lots of different plants, which is a huge advantage, by the way, because we get to see all the different angles and facets and different ways of doing things. It's abundantly clear when you walk in a plant immediately immediately. Yeah. So you walk in the front desk, right? The person who's sitting, well, number one, is there somebody at the front desk? You know, that's just extra cost and labor. We don't need that, right? We'll cut that. Is there actually somebody at the front desk who greets you and says, hi, welcome to our facility. We're so glad you're here, Peter. 
The whole group is waiting for you. We're really happy to have you here. Oh, yeah. Oh, by the way, I want to sit down with you and go over our GMP so that you understand what we require in our facility. Oh, great. Absolutely. By the way, can I get you a drink or something like that while you're waiting for everybody to gather? Yeah, it's it's great to, to be received in that manner and then to see that flow through. And the fact that you can walk up to anyone on, on site and have a conversation, not an audit checklist question and response, but a conversation about tell me about what's happening in this practice here. Why do you think this is the best way of managing these sorts of things? And and just having an actual conversation with people and and you know it's it's such a refreshing change. I, I can I can relay that when we when I started this audit on this site uh, in Vietnam, there was about five people in the opening meeting, and we start walking through the factory. And every so often I'd look over my shoulder and there's more people joining the queue. It was like a conga line at the end. By the <laughs> end, there was about 25 people, I kid you not, following us around on this inspection tour in the factory because they were all, and they had pens and paper, they were all intently waiting on some pearl of wisdom that they could go take away and put immediately into practice into there. Were, it was like a walking lecture, you know, a philosopher's walk, so to speak. So um, that was that was so unusual that there's this crowd following you around because hang on a minute he's going to say something really good about this step or this process and that actually put me under a bit of a pressure because I was thinking shit what do I say here now you know like, <laughs> how, do I, <laughs> how do I drop a pearl of wisdom here and then keep walking type stuff but but that's what it was like these people wanted to know more so that they could learn from best practice and implement it immediately it was it was incredible to see yeah I mean. And, and you get those juxtapositions. And yeah, to your example, opening meeting, right? You have the auditing opening meeting. And the only person sitting there is you and the quality manager. And yeah. you're like, oh, okay, right? Yeah. And then the closing meeting happens and the plant manager shows up and says, okay, what's my score? Right? Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah, that tells me a whole lot right there. Yeah, to your, you go on the floor, right? There's all these little, it, it's almost kind of like, all right, so human beings are social animals. And we take cues from each other. And it's like if you're single and you're going on a date or things like this, right? There, there's these little things. Is this person interested in me or not? Or these type of things. A plant is the same. A plant is the same. What message is this plant sending me? Is this someone who's happy that I'm here? Or is this someone who wants me to leave as quickly as possible? Yeah. And you pick up on that right away. Um, you go out on the floor. To your point, Peter, uh, the, the, the people who are working the line, they, re they look over and they see you and they do this. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It, uh, yeah, I mean, so, I mean, so I spend one of so here's one of the tips I do now is I spend at least thirty minutes with the HR department every time mm -hmm. I go on site to to do risk reviews and risk assessments. I try and see if they've done an engagement survey, what their staff turnover mm -hmm. rates are. I, I look for all of this, and I, I see the conditions at which they provide their their staff that are working there i understand the the distances or the, if they understand how far people are coming to work and and what financial constraints are on them why am i looking at this stuff brian i'm looking at it because this is the underpinning uh foundations of a culture on site if you are tuned in to what your people are doing what they're feeling and what they're thinking it's not going to support or be conducive to good culture yeah. in your place it, it's yeah. just not and tell me the last time there was a food safety audit that went in and looked at uh human resources and and, and people and culture attributes and that there was something to talk about yeah generally how that goes right is the auditor sits in the conference room and says okay uh we're not going to look at the training the quality manager will say okay here are five randomly picked training records for you to review yeah Really? Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, to your point, right? If, if you're out on the floor and you're walking around, let's say the plant manager and the quality manager, and you've got a group, good group with like you were talking about, and they're walking around and, and the plant manager talks with someone and says, hey, Lisa, how are you doing? How, how was your uh, son's softball game? Did he win last week? Right? Yeah. Those details matter, right? Absolutely. People want to know you care. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, having a good social culture a good uh, network of people that support each other on site breaks down a lot of barriers on site i mean nothing worse than say the warehousing team are fighting with the production manager about where to store work in progress 
product should it go back into their cold rooms or their freezers no way get that stuff out it's contaminated do we leave it in the corridor between warehouse and production no way it's going to get contaminated again do we stick it in production somewhere no it's going to be a problem of floor space and it could pre present an issue so there's already these um, antagonisms built up between departments who are just trying to be as efficient as they can in their day and move stuff through but when you start breaking that down with good culture people come together and solve problems quite quite quickly Exactly. So Sebastian, I can, I can tell he's got he's got the wheels turning here. So oh, yeah. uh, what's your view on supplier to chart changing their customer pricing based on audit grade? So if you score an A, you get a, a buck more a unit or things like this. I got some thoughts on that. Let's hear yours first. Well, isn't this just the same thing about setting up competition for, for winners and losers at the at the end of the day? And what you end up with is people that um, end up in fraudulent activity at some point and also corruption. So one of the other things I spend my time on these days, Brian, is I do a lot of fraud and corruption assessments for governments, mm -hmm. private industry, um, major, major blue chips around the world to sort of root out the, the causes of corruption and fraudulent activity and competitive nature is one of the main seeds that are planted in in starting this behavior off in, in what would have been otherwise ethical behavior the minute you start putting these parameters in place these competitive parameters you're now introducing a risk of fraudulent and corrupt uh, activity yeah and so yeah so to sebastian's point there be careful what you measure because now the message internally in the company is going to be, you'd better get a good score on that audit because if you don't, you're costing our company a million dollars. Yeah, absolutely. And so you will do anything to, to achieve the result. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. But it's, it's a good thought, right? It's so trying to figure these things out. And I think Catherine's on the right path here. And this is what we've been talking about here as well. Wouldn't it be great if the audit score reflected engagement and participation, right? Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. And all these little things. And it, it's interesting because auditors are people just like everybody else. And there's a bell curve of auditors. There, there are superstar auditors who are amazing. And good luck trying to get one of those to come in and audit your facility because they're booked years in advance. Yeah. And then you have the middle of the pack and then you, you've got the, the subpar auditors, just like anything else in any type of a bell curve. Why are those auditors so good? And it's exactly what we're talking about here today. They go beyond the checklist, right? They're there to help that company get better yeah. and doing it in a way that doesn't ethically hurt their profession or things like this. And they know how to do those things and they do it in a personable way, right? Because part of this too is don't be a dick. Right? Yeah. Part of this is right, a, lot of, a lot of auditors come in with a chip on their shoulder, right? And they're to their point, they've been trained to find mistakes, right? Everything in their career is about finding flaw in what other people are doing. That's got to be tough, right? Wouldn't it be great if auditors were out there trying to find good things? Yeah, the strengths-based approach to, to assessing a company's capability and future performance, why wouldn't you look at their strengths and say, based on that, they're assuring their future production looks like whatever, you know, let's put in some confidence ratings uh, around Yes, based on what we've seen, my confidence interval assessment or my confidence rating of this place is 92%, for instance, you know, versus saying you've got uh, 15 minor non-conformances, which add up to two major non-conformances, and I'm sort of teetering on the edge of one critical because you've got this, what garbage, Brian? What absolute yeah. garbage? And then you get another auditor through that looks at the previous audit report and says, I don't get this. And you know what? It's like changing the ref on the field midway through the game with a different set of rules. And yeah. people are saying, oh, this game's one side's going to love it and the other side's going to hate it. Oh, this game just became so much easier. Why didn't we get that ref in the beginning? And the other one's saying, what the hell just happened here? There's no way we're going to score points against this this team with this ref on the field. So it's not it's, – it's the compliance system again and how people are taught to apply a compliance approach to, to our industry, it's it's non-sustainable practice. It really isn't. The minute you take that out, and we saw that with COVID, the minute you take these people off the field, people go back to basic instincts, which is, oh, shit, i got to get product out the door. And no yeah. one's telling me what's best practice or what's right and wrong here. So I'll keep 
tweaking the margin a little bit. Uh, I'll cut that corner just a little bit more and just a little bit more. And you end up with what's called a desire line. Now, in architectural terms, this is where it came from. Imagine you're walking down a, a parkway and there's two, two concrete paths that intersect, but in between there's a dirt track that people have worn through because it's the shortcut. That's yeah. called a desire line. And that's exactly what happens when we work in compliance systems is people find those shortcuts. And those desire lines are really evident by watching practices and watching how people make decisions, looking at what customers are saying through feedback, complaints, all that sort of stuff. You start, you can start a good order to contract desire lines really quickly through uh, through on-site systems and and personnel reviews. Oh, that's brilliant! I love that. Yeah. So, gosh, so much to go over. I mean, so part of this too, right? Is is figuring out the path forward and and yeah. for me a big part of this is those best practices right and and so communicating those and, and number one thank you for everyone who is here because that's exactly what we're doing here is we're sharing best practices and that's one of the more difficult things in what we do if you're working for a company and you're a food safety manager director of quality or what have you um the knowledge that you create and the good ideas that you have and the successful executions stay in that bubble. They, they don't get out of that. It's very rare they get an opportunity. Let's say maybe they go to a conference and they get to give a presentation or things like this. It's not like you're going to other companies and saying, hey, guess what? I've got some, some good practices you might want to install in your company. They're going to go, what? Get out yeah. of here. You, you know, yeah. we don't need, yeah. So figuring out those ways to share these best practices is paramount. Absolutely. And you know, it's it's no longer about the system that you're using. It's about how do you manage personnel on site to alter their behaviors around what sort of good decisions they make to protect food safety. Why aren't people and personnel CCPs in, in HACCP systems? Why 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 is that always overlooked? Why is it a bit of machinery or a tool? or a measuring item that remains the CCP. The people operate this crap all the time. I've been to so many places where testing the metal detector is done so poorly because, oh, crap, I lost that uh, that non-ferrous piece somewhere. Where did, where did that go? Oh, it doesn't matter. We'll run the small one. If it picks that up, everything's okay. <laughs> That's not the point of the exercise, right? It's curbing those behaviours and allowing people also, this is a really critical point, Brian, is rewarding people and recognizing people that will push the big red button on the production line and stop it because they don't feel as though it's safe for product to proceed past their point. You know, you don't want to be, oh, that's the next person down the line or that machine will pick it up or, you yeah, know, second shift, you second see shift. label, test it and find it and then we'll rework it or we'll dump it or something like that. Something down the line somewhere is going to pick it up. That's the, that's the behaviors we're trying to root what's the future for us in food safety versus food supply is working on behaviors is forming teams of people that have the right behaviors to spot solve problems and to break down bigger problems to put shit six sigma and ishikawa processes in to root out the problems and incrementally improve processes and reward and recognize those people that do that because once we start getting that right, there is no need for compliance-based assessments because right. you're going to check the behaviour and you're looking at practices on site, demonstration of good practices, the Vietnam gold standard factory that I went to. Imagine if everyone ran like that. That's what we're looking for. Yeah, and, and so I want to make sure that everybody caught what you had said there because it's so important. Personnel practices as critical control points. So imagine, let's tease that out a little bit. Imagine you had a CCP for personnel practices on the line. And let's say that you're on a line with product that's going down the line. It's raw, open product that's being processed or what have you. And a piece falls off the line and falls on the floor. And then the operator picks it up and throws it back on the line, right? Yep. Red button, right? Yeah. Red button. Yeah. Everybody who sees that should immediately go, holy shit, what did you just do? What, what, wait, yeah. what? You just pick yeah. that up off the floor and put it on the line. Shut down, shut down. Sanitation, stop all production, right? Immediate. 
Yep. Okay. One thing I always ask when I go in to do assessments at CCP points is what's different about the person operating the process at this CCP? Do they have better training? Mm -hmm. Are they uh, more recognised? Have they been on the site longer? Are they at supervisor level? Have you done a trusted and vetted process like you see with the IA rules and all that sort of stuff? What do you do about people at those points? Because they're the, meant to be the critical process points in your business. So what have you done differently with those people to make them aware that this is a big red button point? If something fails here, the line should stop and you're allowed to push the button. So yeah. there's there's a small tip there. Is that's what I always do is look at how they deploy, deploy personnel around CCPs and what extra uh, uh, upskilling or competency have they built into that person uh, to mm -hmm. run that, set, including looking at their behaviours. Yeah, exactly. And to your example then, let's say that, for example, you're in a dairy plant and the role of the pasteurizer operator should be one of the highest prestige positions in that plant, right? That person is controlling that microbial risk for the food safety. Yeah. That person should be paid more. That person should be trained better. And that should be a role that people are competing for to show how good they are at doing what they do. Right? Absolutely. Absolutely. The, there should be positions that are paid more in the business because of the criticality to food safety at the end of the day, not to food supply. It's not you know, the production manager pumped out 15% surplus this month based on based on targets, give him, a, give him a raise. That's bullshit. That's not what we're looking for here. We're looking for the people that have reduced the number of rework product on the line, that have reduced dumping and, and, and reject product, that have reduced the number of customer complaints, so that, that have done anything they can to improve, to improve food safety through the organization. They're the people we're recognizing and rewarding in the system. Yeah, and, and provide feedback. One of the things I would do in the past is in my plants, I would post the consumer comments, not the complaints, the positive comments. And we would put them outside the employee break room. Mm. And every week when we put those up, people would go and they would all gather around and read those and they could see. And again, to your point, Peter, that's providing that linkage. That's removing that abstract thought of, uh, this is just crap going down the line. No, it's not. This is yeah. going to people's children. This is absolutely. Families. And like in the quality circles that I, that I also run in, there's the whole principle and practice of right first time, right? That mm -hmm. It doesn't go past me unless it's right. And we're not expecting someone to engineer it out or fix it further down. I would love to see a right first time approach in food safety where that yeah. person can see it and solve the problem. And people might say, we can't do anything about this because it's a supplier issue. It's so far up the line. We just have to accept what comes through the door. Bullshit. If yeah. you're into right first time, your factory will invest the time in sending your team to the supplier and work out the kinks at that end. Why the hell would you do that? Because it's going to save the company a ton of money and angst later on when this defect or low quality, low safety product is coming to the warehouse receivable dock. Yep, absolutely. Sebastian's on a roll here. How do you think companies with better food culture can better influence other cultures? Ah, oh, and that's that's our talk, right? That's kind of what we're getting to here today. Yeah. Is how can we transfer best practices? Yeah, I, I think there needs to be some sort of awards process out there where a global awards for best practice, best practice in food safety. There's plenty of award systems. SQF runs award uh, processes. There's, there's a number of, there's you know, like Baldrige, EFQM, all these places where they're talking about business excellence. Why can't we integrate something like that for this? There's nothing stopping us building uh, a recognition process and a, a reward process. You know, give yeah. them... A, Stand them up in front of an audience, give them a gong, shake their hands, smack, smack them on the bum, put their put their uh, PowerPoint up on the wall about this is the team that created this. Why why aren't we doing that stuff? You know, because yeah, we're now, so um, focused on food supply. Yeah. Now imagine if that. So for the example of your company in Vietnam, imagine if that company were to open its doors and invite other companies in to see yeah. what they're doing. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, as an example, this place has um, has a ILAC accredited laboratory that they're now opening up to their suppliers and uh, other uh, companies around to use because they've got probably the, uh, the best lab and the only lab 
so well stocked with instrumentation in that region of Vietnam, they've already realized that they could be of benefit to companies around them to improve their practices. That's amazing yeah. that someone would do that. Normally you would cloister yeah. that stuff and lock it up and say, get away from my place. I've got a competitive advantage. Yeah. What, you know, what, what is that breeding in people? You know, yeah. How does that yeah, instill good behavior? Yeah, imagine that company in Vietnam now that opens its doors and shows best practices. Are they going to get more business or less business? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. There's definitely more business coming their way. Yeah, exactly. So we're running out of time here, Peter. So let's kind of bring this back up to the 30,000 foot level. Oh, man, a shit ton of stuff we went over today. Any type of a summary or, or closing thoughts you'd like to leave with everyone? Uh, people run businesses. Systems don't run businesses. Invest in the people, recognize and reward people, look for strengths on site to determine the ability for a company to sustain food safety practices. Beautiful, succinct and perfect. And one of the things here that I have, and I'll put the link here in the chat, is on Locals, I have a food safety group where we post recalls and I send them out and things like this. If you haven't joined, join, it's free. It's just part of out there sharing this information and making sure that people are aware. So getting that knowledge out there and sharing, because as we say here on the chat, food safety is not a point of competition. Right? We all fail if food safety fails. It doesn't matter what company you work for. So with that, we'll bring this chat, this amazing chat. I, I knew it was gonna be awesome, Peter, thank you. We're gonna bring this to a close and we will have, our next chat next Friday at our normal time. So 8 a.m. Mountain Time here in the U.S., 10 a.m. East Coast Time. And we'll bring our next expert on here for the next chat. It's going to be hard for them to beat this one, Peter, because this was an amazing chat. So thank you to everybody who joined us on a Friday afternoon or Saturday morning, wherever you may be in the world. And thank you for protecting food supply and bringing the standards up for everyone. So have a great weekend. Enjoy yourselves. And we'll see you back here next Friday. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.